الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى Today's lecture, I want to speak about some rulings and benefits in this noble month that we are in, Shahrullah al Muharram. Benefits, inshallah ta'ala, and some rulings that we can take from this month. This month, Shahrullah al Muharram, is a great blessed month. And it's the first month of the Islamic calendar. And it is one of the four months that are sacred to us as Muslims. Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says in the Quran, In idda shuhuri inda Allah ithna ashara shahran fi kitab Allah, yawma khalaqa samawati wal ard, minha arba'atun hurum, ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us that the months in the year are 12. إِنَّ عِدَّةَ الشُّهُورِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِثْنَا عَشَرَ شَهْرًا There are 12 months in the year. And Allah says, مِنْهَا أَرْبَعَةٌ حُرُمْ There are four sacred months in the year. So within those 12 months, there are four months which we call them Ashhur al-Hurum. We call them Ashhur al-Hurum. The ayah didn't state what are those four months. But the sunnah came and explained it. The sunnah, it came and explained what are those four months. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in the hadith which Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim both narrated in their sahih. Min hadith Abi Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The messenger said, Inna zamana qad istadaraka kahayatihi. That the time has spinned back to its original form. What does that mean? Before Islam, the Arab pagans, they used to change Ashur al Hurum. Whenever they wanted to fight with a tribe, they would delay Ashhur al Hurum. They would push it back. And if they felt like they didn't want to fight that year, they would bring back Ashhur al Hurum to its original place or they would bring it forward. So they tampered with it. They played with it. So the Arab pagans, they played around with the months. Whenever they wanted to fight, they would push back the month. Because in these months you can't fight. Even to them they didn't used to fight. So they would play with the months. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in this hadith, In The time has been brought back to its original form. Everything is now correct. When Islam came, it corrected the time. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said, There are 12 months in the year. Minha arba'atun hurum. There are four sacred months. Now look at the sunnah. is going to explain to us what are these four months. Thalathatun mutawaliyat. Three of those months from the four, three are consecutive. They are one after the other. They are what? Consecutive. What are they? Dhul qi'dah, dhul hijjah, and Muharram, they are next to each other. And then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so the first one is Dhul Qa'dah, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram, they are together. Thalathatun Mutawaliyat. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Warajabu Mudar. And Rajab is alone. But the Prophet attributed and he ascribed Rajab to a particular tribe. Who were they? Mudar. Mudar is a qabila, it's a tribe from the Arab tribes. They used to respect uh, this month. 
They used to venerate it. They used to look after this month. So the ayah told us there are four sacred months. And the hadith told us what those four months are. Let's go back to the ayah. Allah says, فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ What does it mean? فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Al-Imam Al-Qurtubiyu, the great Mufassir, the scholar of Tafsir, Abu Abdullah Al-Qurtubi, he said in his Tafsir book, he says, فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not transgress on one another. What it means is, خَصَّ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى أَرْبَعَةَ الْأَشْهُرِ بِالذِّكْرِ وَنَهَا عَنُ الظُّلْمِ فِيهَا تَشْرِيفًا لَهَا وَإِنْ كَانَ مَنْ هِيَنْ عَنْهُ فِي كُلِّ زَمَانٍ These four months, the transgression is made more serious. You are not allowed to transgress on anyone. You are not allowed to oppress anyone. And in these four months that we just mentioned, Dhul Qa'dah, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, and Rajab, those four months you can't oppress anybody. It's more serious. And you're not allowed to oppress yourself. What does it mean you don't oppress yourself? It means that you stay away from sinning. Because the sin is an oppression of yourself. وَلِذَلِكَ Abdullah ibn Abbas and Ata and others, they said, the sins that are done in this months, these four months, are greater than the sins that are done in any other month. Oh, pay attention to this. The sins that a person does in Ashhurul Hurum is greater than the sins that are done in any other time of the year. The question here is, what is the wisdom? Why only this month that we're in right now today is attributed to Allah? Why do we say Shaharullah al Muharram, the month of Allah Muharram? Why do we say that? Why don't we say Shaharullah Ramadan? Why is this the only month that Allah attributed to Himself? He ascribed it to Himself and not any other month. The scholars, they mention, number one, the virtue of this month is great. But that still doesn't answer the question. Why? Because Ramadan is also a noble month. And Ramadan is a virtuous month. Rather, Ramadan is better than Muharram. So why is Muharram attributed to Allah but not Ramadan? Al-Imam Jalaluddin al-Suyuti in his kitab Al-Dibaj fi Sharh Al-Dibaj fi Sharh Sahih Muslim Ibn Al-Hajjaj Suyuti mentions the reason why only this month of Muharram is attributed to Allah and not any other month including Ramadan is because Muharram is the only month that Islam gave it that name and not any other month Ramadan before Islam it was called Ramadan all of the other months they had their names before Islam and Islam used those names. Like in this month Muharram, Islam gave it that name. And this is a fa'idah, a benefit. That this month Muharram is a shari Islamic name. Islam gave it that name. And Suyuti also mentions in his sharh of Sahih Sunan, uh, sh uh, sorry, the sharh of Sunan Nasa'i, the call of Al-Hafidh Abu Al-Fadl Al-Iraqi. You can also see it there, inshallah ta'ala. I now want to move on to another point, which is the virtue in increasing in fasting this month. Abu Huraira narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this hadith is found in Sahih Muslim, that Abu Huraira said, Afdalu siyami, the best fasting, Ba'da Ramadan, after the month of Ramadan. Afdalu siyami, the best fasting, Ba'da Ramadan, after Ramadan. Is what? Is the fasting of what? Shahrullah al-Muharram. The best fasting after Ramadan is this month of Shahrullah al-Muharram. The Prophet said this. So each and every one of us should try to fast. The scholars, they differed between themselves. They differed. 
Should the person fast the whole month? Or should he fast the majority of the month? The reason why they differed is because of the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha where she said that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he never fasted a complete month in its totality except Ramadan. And the next month that he would fast a lot of it was Sha'ban. So it shows that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not fast all of Ramadan, all of Muharram. And that he fasted the majority of it. And the second group of scholars, they said, this hadith of Abu Huraira that we just mentioned, which is, Afdalu Siyami Ba'da Ramadan, is Shahrullah Al-Muharram. This hadith shows that the person should fast all of it. That they should what? That they should try to fast all of the days in this particular month because of the virtue that are in it. If this month is that virtuous and it's that great, what is the real significance of this virtue? I mean, where does this virtue stem from? What is actually giving it this virtue? The scholars, they said, is a particular day within it that gives it this virtue. In this month of Muharram, there's a day called Yom Ashura. The day of Ashura. It's in this month. And it's on the 10th of Muharram. What is Yom Ashura? Yom Ashura, as Ibn Abbas mentioned, he said that Anna Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lamma qadima al Medina. When the messenger came to the city of Medina. So this is called the Mursal al Sahabi because Ibn Abbas was very young to know when the Prophet came to Medina. He was only three years old. So Ibn Abbas must have heard it from another companion. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, and he said, when the messenger came to Medina, who was in Medina? Three tribes from the people, the Jews. Three tribes of the Jews lived in Medina. Banu Nadir, Banu Qaynuqa'ah, and Banu, Banu Nadir, Banu Qaynuqa'ah, and what? Banu Quraida. These were the three tribes of the Jews that lived in what? They reside in Medina. So when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, one of the early things that he did was, he first of all done a contract with them. Second thing that he did was, he saw things from them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And from the things that he saw from them was that, they were fasting on the 10th of Muharram. This particular day, they were fasting. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked about this. And he said to them, what is it that I see you fasting in this particular day? And they said to the Prophet, هَذَا يَوْمٌ عَظِيمٌ This is a great day, Muhammad. وَهُوَ يَوْمٌ It's a day, نَجَّ اللَّهُ فِيهِ مُوسَى Allah saved Musa وَأَغْرَقَ فِرْعَونَ And Allah drowned Fir'aun in the ocean. It's the day Allah saved Nabi Allah Musa. So when they said that, Nabi Allah Muhammad said, Musa is more closer to me than you. It's more befitting that we the Muslims fast on this day than you all. Fasama who the Prophet fasted it, and he commanded the companions to fast it. And this, the scholars they say, was the time when the fasting of Ashura was wajib. That was abrogated later. Ashura was obligatory to be fasted at a particular time. You had to fast it. And then after that, what happened? It became what? Highly recommended. The obligation doesn't no longer stand. Why? Because Ramadan came. Ramadan came after Ashura. So Ramadan became obligatory and Ashura became highly recommended. And that a person should fast it. The Prophet used to make sure he looked after this particular day. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said in the Hadith Sahih Muslim, he said, Ma ra'aytu nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, I did not see the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yataharra. Ma ma'ana yataharra. Hafidh ibn Hajar, he said, A yaqsidu sawbahu li tahsili thawabihi wa raghbati fi. I never saw the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so eager 
to gain reward from something in fasting the way he was salawatullahi wa alayhi in this particular day. يتحرى صيام يومي فضله الله على غير إلا هذا إلا هذا اليوم يوم عاشوراء. I never saw the Prophet give all of his energy and enthusiasm salawatullahi wa sallam alayhi than this particular day يوم عاشوراء. So he used to work hard for this day. So it's upon each and every one of us to do that. To fast the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram. And there's a reward connected to it. The reward that is connected to it is found in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, وَصِيَامُهُ And the fasting, أَمَا وَصِيَامُ يَوْمُ Ashura, The fasting of Ashura, أَحْتَسِبُ The Prophet said, I hope عَلَى اللَّهِ from Allah أَن يُكَفِّرَ سَنَةَ الَّتِي قَبْلَهِ I hope from Allah that he will forgive us for the sins that we done our last year. So Ashura is not better than the day of Arafah. Arafah is better because Arafah is the year before and the year after. So it's two years, Arafah. Like in Ashura is just the year before. Question here. The scholars, they said, is the sins that forg are forgiven, are they the major sins or the minor sins? Or are they both? The views of the scholars are many. The scholars, they said, three views. Number one, this month, uh, this day, Ashura, your minor sins will be forgiven with the condition that you stay away from the major sins. With the condition that you what? That you stay away from the major sins. Because didn't Allah say in the ayah, إِنَّ عِدَّةَ الشُّهُورِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِثْنَا عَشَرَ شَارًا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ يَوْمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ مِنْهَا أَرْبَعَةُ الْحُرُمْ ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not transgress on yourselves. Do not come with major sins. So if you want for Allah to give your minor sins, you have to stay away from the major sins. That's one group of scholars. They said if you do that, and you stay away from the major sins, Allah will not only forgive you for your what? Allah will not only forgive you for the minor sins, but He also forgive you for the major sins. That's the first group. The second group of scholars, they said, and that's the strongest inshallah ta'ala, that all of your minor sins will be forgiven, and the major sins, they require repentance. Major sins, they always require what? Repentance. That's the second view, which is the strongest. And the third view is that you are forgiven for the major and the minor with no condition stipulated. And that is the weakest of the views. The Prophet ﷺ, he never only used to fast Yawmu Ashura. Or he wished more like to fast a day other than Ashura. He wished Salawatullah wasalamu alayhi to fast a day other than Ashura with it. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma he said, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the messenger said, La in baqitu if I remain, meaning if Allah gives me a life to live longer, qabilin, if I live for another year. I will fast the ninth. I will fast the what? So I will fast the ninth of Muharram and I will fast the what? The tenth, both of them. So it is highly recommended to fast the ninth and the, and the tenth. Here the scholars, they are asked, what is the hikmah, the wisdom of fasting on the ninth? What's the hikmah? I'm going to give you the statement of Al-Imam al nawi in his Majmu' which is the Sharh of Muhadda ibn Abi Ishaq al-Shirazi. Nawi says there's a three wisdoms that the scholars mentioned. Why one should fast, I mean, why it's recommended to fast on the ninth. The first reason they said, it is mukhalafatul al-Yahud, to go against the Jews. Because the Prophet wanted to fast on the tenth, and the Jews were fasting on the tenth, he didn't want to follow them. So how did he change it? He fasted two days. Just to not be like them, alayhi salatu was salam, and this is in the hadith of Al-Imam Ahmad in his Musnad. That the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Sumu yawm Ashura, fast the day of Ashura. Wa khaliful yahuda and go against the Jews by doing what? 
وصوموا قبله fast a day before it وبعده or after it the wow here is للتنويع or, or after it go against them that's the first wisdom why one should fast on the ninth the second wisdom that the scholars mention is the same way that you're not allowed to fast on Monday by itself you're not allowed to fast on Ashura by itself you have to fast a day with it Friday can you fast by itself no you either have to fast a day before it or a day after it so the second goal is that to fast on the day of Ashura you have to do a day before it or after it you can't do it by itself that's the second view now we mentioned some scholars took that view such as Imam al-Khattabi in his Sharh Sunan Abi Dawood the third view is Al-Ihtiyar the reason why you're fasting on the ninth is because what could have happened is a mistake could have occurred by the sighting of the moon the sighting of the moon might be wrong and so you might miss the day of Ashura so to be on the safe side if you fast a day before it what will happen you most likely catch it either on the 10th or at night before it's on the 9th you will get hold of it so to be on the safe side those are the three wisdoms why the scholars rahimahumullah mention my beloved brothers these months going by like that is your life going by fast you take lessons from it you saw a year just finished that's a year that has gone by from your life that will never come back you will never live that life again you have now started a new year this it means that you're every day getting closer to your grave وَلِذَلِكَ دَتْ سَلَفُ هَذِي الْأُمَّةِ The pious predecessors, every single day of their life, they knew it was a day closer to the meeting of their Lord, Allah Azza wa Jalla. And each and every one of us will be asked about our life and how we spent it. The hadith Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi narrated in his sunan, in hadith Abi Barzat Al-Aslami, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, لَا تَزُولُ قَدَمَاءِ عَبْدٍ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ A person's legs will not move from its position the day of judgment. حتى يسأل عن أربع and another رواية says حتى يسأل عن عن خمس until he's asked about five or four questions from those questions that you're going to be asked is عن عمره فيما أفنى how did you spend your life how did you spend your age that was given to you Allah gave you a time to live Allah says in the Quran أولم نعمركم ما يتذكر فيه من تذكر وجاءكم النذير Allah says, did I not give you a life to live? A time to live, did I not give you? وَجَاءَكُمُ النَّذِيرِ And the warner came to you. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said that the warner that is meant in the ayah is that white hair came into your beard or your head. That's a warner that's saying to you, your time is finishing. You're getting closer to Allah Azza wa Jalla. And your meeting point is not far-fetched. So when you see the months going fast, it was the other day when we were celebrating Eid. A couple of months before that we were what? We were fasting the month of Ramadan. Just after that it was Hajj. Your life is going that fast. Your Umur is going fast. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, نِعْمَتَانِ مَغْبُونُ فِيهِمَا كَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ الصِّحَةُ وَالْفَرَاغِ Two blessings that Allah has given Many people are heedless of. They don't know the value of what they have. What are they? A siha, free time that you have. You have a lot of free time. You don't see the value of what you have. And also, the free time here is the ni'mah of time. Wal faragh and health. Allah has given you subhanahu wa ta'ala health. You look at how mashallah you're fragile. How mashallah, you're not fragile, you're strong. You're able to do things. A poet once said, he grew very old, and so he went to a well. He went to a well, and he threw a bucket inside the well. And he tried to pull out the bucket to bring out the water. And then he realized he can't pull it as he used to when he was young. And so he said, Mali idha jadabtuha sa'aytu, akibarun alani anbaytu. Why is it that now that I try to pull out the bucket, I'm making noise. I'm saying, ah. 
Mali ida jadabtuha, saitu, akibarun alani ambaitu. What is it that's making me heavy? What is it that's pushing me down? That's making me the way I am right now, weak, senile, fragile. And then he says, Laita shabab and bu'a fashtaraitu. I wish that youth was something that was sold and bought in the market. I could go and I could buy the opportunity of one. It's again being a person who's young. I wish. He's hoping for time to be rewinded. And so he can go back. He now realizes the value of time and the blessing Allah has given him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's now that you realize this month of Muharram, it's a time that you ponder and you contemplate. And you think over, what have you done the last past year? What did you accomplish? What did you, what did you accumulate? What righteous deeds that you, did you come with? Also, this month of Muharram and also the other months of the year as a believer, it should have significance for you. Ya ikhwah, brothers, you should know the Islamic events in the year. The scholars taken, take, they took time out to speak about every single month in the year what the Prophet ﷺ used to do and the value of that particular month. Al-Imam al-Nasa'i, he wrote a kitab called what? He wrote a kitab called Amal al-Yawmi wal-Layla. Ibn Sunni, he wrote a kitab called Amal al-Yawmi wal-Layla. Ibn Hajar wrote a kitab called Amal al-Yawmi wal-Layla. Suyuti wrote a kitab called Amal al-Yawmi wal-Layla. Al-Imam ibn Rajab, he wrote a kitab called Lata'if al-Ma'arif. All of these books, what do they talk about? They talk about every single month in the year what the messenger used to do. What did he do in that month? What acts of ibadat was he doing to get closer to Allah by? And so as a Muslim, a Islamic month should not come in except you know what this month is. What's the virtue of this month? What's the value of this month? What are the things that I could do to get closer to Allah Azza wa Jalla? Everybody around you today that you look at who's righteous, who's noble, who the day of judgment is going to have a high station, they've only passed you in one of two things. Either they've passed you in beneficial knowledge. They have more knowledge than you. And the second thing is righteous deeds. And that's all the religion of Islam came to for you to accomplish. Beneficial knowledge and what? Righteous deeds. Knowing every single month, what is the value of this month? What did the Prophet do in this month? And then straight away, knowing what you need to do and then executing it. Muharram came in, what is the value? What do, I, what do I need to do? Ashura is on the 10th, okay, I need to fast, okay. And on the 9th, I need to fast as well, okay. Beneficial knowledge is vital, brothers. There are some people, Muharram came in and it probably might even go and they don't even know that Muharram has come. And they don't even know the value of that month. Let alone doing righteous deeds in that particular month. And coming with what? In this day of Yom Ashura, the people are one of two. A people who have followed the Prophet ﷺ in what he did. And what did we say the Prophet did on the day of Ashura? He fasted alayhi salatu wasalam. That's what's been transmitted to us from the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Another group of people, they went against the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasalam in the day of Ashura. So they did one of two things. A group of people, they d used the day of Ashura as a day of sadness and sorrow. Because of an event that took place in Islamic history. A noble, virtuous companion. The grandson of the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. It was this day that he became a martyr. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he was unjustly killed. So they take this opportunity this day to show and express sorrow and sadness. This is opposition in the way of the Prophet. ﷺ. The Prophet didn't, didn't do this, nor did his companions. The second group of people who went against the Prophet ﷺ in the day of Ashura are a people who celebrated it like it's Eid. And so that day, 
what they do is they do a tawassu fi nafaqa they give out they gather the family together like it's Eid celebration and this is not what the Prophet and all the companions did the only thing that has been transmitted to us that he did was what? that he fasted alayhi salatu wasalam and as we all know man amila amala laysa alayhi amruna warad anyone who does an action that is not from what the Prophet did and his companions what is it? it's rejected and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi also said man ahdata fi amrina هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَوَرَدْ Anyone who introduces a matter into the religion, that which is not from it, it's what? It's rejected. So if you're trying to get closer to Allah, the way that you can get closer to Allah is the way of the Prophet ﷺ. As the Salaf used to say, الطُرُقُ كُلُّهَا مَسْدُودَ إِلَّا مَنِ اقْتَفَى أَثَرَ مُحَمَّدٍ All of the paths and the roads are closed. They're blocked. There's no way to Allah except the road that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took. That's the only way to Allah. Because why do we do a righteous deed for? What is the reason why we worship Allah? For Allah to be pleased with us and for Allah to love us. But if you do this act, how do you know Allah is pleased with you in doing this act? And how do you know Allah is happy with it and loves it? The only way that you could have found out is through the Messenger and if the Prophet didn't legislate it, then you're doing something you don't know whether Allah is pleased with it, nor if He's have loves with it, Subhanahu wa Taala. Also, those of you who've understood these ahkam and these rulings and learnt it, take it upon yourself to convey it to your family members, because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told us, "Adalu ala al kafa'ili." The one who shows others good is like he himself has done it. So if you go out and you inform a person of the day of Ashura and on the night and you tell them about it and they may not have known about it and they fast that day, you get the reward of that person's fasting that day. You get the what? The reward of that person who's fasting that particular day. And Allah Azza wa Jalla will reward you and he will not reduce it from that person who's fasting. Meaning he will get his full reward and you get the full reward of what he did as well. So convey it. And tell your family members about it. The things that you can do and the things that you can't do. The fasting of the day of Ashura is, the, is like the fasting of every, any other time. Meaning, it's the ahkam that are pertaining to fasting in Ramadan also applies here. The only difference is Ashura is not obligatory. So when you're fasting, it's incorrect to fast believing that it's obligatory. You should fast believing that it's what? Highly recommended. And it's against the Prophet Sallallahu way that if you miss Ashura, to bring it back. If you've missed it, it's an innovation to go out and bring it back. By saying what? By saying, I missed Ashura, so I'm going to bring it back. Because the Prophet didn't do that, nor did his companions do that, nor has it been transmitted to us from the pious predecessors that they did that. It's highly recommended, don't miss it. And if you do miss it, for whatever reason it may be, then hope for the next year to come for you to fast, inshaAllah ta'ala. I will open the floor, inshaAllah ta'ala, for questions and answers. Anything which I have said that was wrong and incorrect is from me and Shaytan, and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. سبحانك اللهم بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أستغفرك وأتوب إليك تفضل One of the most common books I can't say is the most comprehensive because I haven't compared it but one of the most common books and the beneficial book is the كتاب لطائف المعارف Lata'if al-Ma'arif by Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali. That kitab is very valuable. And he has beneficial statements and quotes. And at the beginning of the book, he talks about the value of time. And the importance that time means to us as Muslims. And how Allah wa ta'ala values time by swearing by time. He swore by Layl, or by Nahar, Asr. And he also swore by time in general. 
And Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He speaks about the in the fikhtilaf al-layli wa nahari la-ayat. There are signs in all of this. The day coming in and the night leaving, there are signs in all of this. So Ibn Rajab speaks about that in the beginning and then after that he talks about every single month. And he starts with the month of Muharram. Because the month of Muharram is the first? It's the first month. Who made it the first month? Umar and Uthman and Ali ibn Abi Talib. They made it the first month. They, the Sahabas agreed that this is going to be the first month of the year. And what's the last month of the Islamic calendar? Yeah? So the sacred month starts with the year and it finishes with the year. Are you with me, brothers? So we have one of the four Ashhurul Hurum starts. Walidalika Ibn Rajab brings a fa'idah out of that and also Ibn Hajar, which is as a Muslim, you are beginning your year with staying away from that which is haram. And also what? You're exiting the year with staying away from haram. Well, that's why Ibn, Ra- Ibn Hajar said that it was called Shahrullah al Muharram, haram. Staying away from that which is haram. Staying away from that which is not permissible. And you finish your year with Dhul Hijjah, which is a year where you've done Hajj and your sins are clean. Arafah, and now you're starting a new year. Now. So Umar and Uthman and Ali were the ones who placed this month of Muharram as the first year, as the first month of the year. Any other questions? Fadbal. Sheikh Nasir rahimahullah, Sheikh Al-Albani rahimahullah, he held a view regarding the fasting of Saturday. He took the hadith of the Prophet sallam, Do not fast on Saturday unless it's obligatory on you. The hadith Imam Abu Dawood narrated in his Sunan. This hadith, there is a dispute in its authenticity. If you hold this hadith to be sahih, if you do hold this hadith to be sahih, that's one situation. If you believe the hadith is weak and it's not authentic, then the discussion Sheikh Al-Albani is bringing forward does not apply with you, apply on you. Are we all together? The scholars, they differ on its authenticity. I'm of the opinion that the hadith is sahih and it's authentic. Now that I agree that the hadith is sahih, I also don't agree with Sheikh Al-Albani's view in this issue. لا تصوموا يوم السبت إلا في مفترض عليكم the view that Sheikh Al-Albani رحمه الله رحمة واسعة in which he holds that the fasting of Friday is not Saturday is not allowed unless it's obligatory this hadith you can't take it and reject the other hadiths out there because the qa'idah is what? as Al-Imam Abdullah ibn Hajj al-Shaqiti mentions in his thousand lines of poetry in Usul al-Fiqh Maraq al-Su'ud, he says, وَالْجَمْعُ وَاجِبٌ مَتَى مَا أَمْكَنَا إِلَّا وَلِلْأَخِيرِ نَسْخٍ بُيِّنَا If you have many evidences, and they seem like they're going against each other, what you first have to try is to reconcile them, bring them together. So what is the other hadith that seems to be going against this issue? The hadith of Juwayriya. The Prophet ﷺ saw Juwayriya fasting on Friday, and he said to her, أَصُنْتِي يَوْمًا قَبْلَهُ did you fast the day before Friday? She said, no. He said, Are you going to fast a day after to Friday? So what's the day before after Friday? Saturday. Saturday. She said, no, I'm not going to fast on Saturday as well. Then the Prophet said, break your fast. So this hadith shows us that the fasting on Saturday is what? It's something that's legislated. So we have to try to reconcile between the ahadith. Sheikh al-Albani, rahimahullah, he tried to answer all of these ahadiths. I've heard his discussion. There was a discussion, if you listen to it, with him and Sheikh Abdul Muhsin al-Abad, where they meet each other, but they discuss this issue. Um, but I don't want to go too much details because it's a bit sophisticated topic. But if it does happen, 
that the day of Ashura happens. What day is the day of Ashura? It's going to be on a Thursday, right? It's going to be on a Thursday. Huh? Because we don't have that issue right now, there's no need to discuss it. But if an issue like that arises, that a Friday and a Saturday fasting happens, then inshallah ta'ala, maybe we might, we might make it one Friday night reflection discussing this issue and the fiqh related and the ruling in more details inshallah ta'ala. No. No. Because of the issue of Mukhalafat al Yahud, which is there, then La Shaka Shaykh al Islam Taymin is Kitab Iqtaba al Salat al Mustaqim and Mukhalafat Ashab al Jaib. He says that it sh the person should fast a day either before it or after it. So if he misses the night, he should try to fast the 11. No. Is it recommended? So is it recommended to fast all of Muharram? Naam, based on the zahir of the hadith, it's permissible, you can. The zahir is what? Well, if you go to Kitab Aunul Ma'bud, which is the Sharh Sunan Abi Dawood, he mentions the reason why the Prophet is not transmitted from him that he fasted all of Muharram is because Ashura and the, 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 the ruling of Muharram was one of the last rulings for the Prophet So he didn't live long to have fasted the whole month. That's one. And the second one was that the Prophet ﷺ, a majority of the months of Muharram was when he was traveling. So that's why he didn't fast all of Muharram. And Walidarik Abdul Azim al Abadi, rahimahullah, from India, he has a Sharh Sunnah Abi Dawood, which is called Aun al Ma'bud. He explains that particular point. Rahimahullah ta'ala. So if you, so if, so having two int intentions, which is to fast on, uh, fasting on Ashura and Friday, the issue of tadakhul in niyat to enter two intentions into each other, it's permissible as long as they are both voluntary or one is voluntary and the other one is wajib. But you're not allowed to bring two wajibat together. Does that make sense? This is the strongest opinion. Meaning, the Prophet he sometimes used to pray, he used to pray alayhi salatu wasalam, and he would also teach the companions how to pray. So how many intentions did he have? Huh? Two intentions. One was to pray. He was praying alayhi salatu wasalam. And so he would go onto the pulpit and he would actually be praying. And he would say to them, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli, pray the way that you see me pray. So he would show them how to pray. That was his intention, that's one intention. And the second intention was what? And he would be praying as well. So it's to teach and to pray. He had two intentions. Sallallahu, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's permissible to have two intentions and to bring them together in this particular issue. So fasting on Thursdays and the fasting of what? The day of Ashura. Any other questions? It's true. Naam, sahih. The word worship. It's true. Sahih, you're right. We're sometimes loose on the translation because the English language is a bit weak. It's true. So the English language is a language which is originally weak to express the words that are used in the Sharia. So la shaka wa la rayb, without a doubt, it's good to use the word ibadah. The reason is because ibadat in Islam, for instance, a man taking a spoon of food 
and placing it in the mouth of his wife with the intention of getting closer to Allah, the Prophet ﷺ told us he gets rewarded for it. In the English language, that's not worship. They don't consider it to be worship. The Prophet ﷺ said, وَفِي بُضْعِ أَحَدِكُمْ صَدَقَةً The intimate relationship that the man has with his spouse is also a form of ibadah that he can get closer to Allah if he comes with the intention. That's not in the English language, the word worship. So he sah, the word worship, it's only seen as going to a particular place and then facing whatever you're worshipping and doing that particular ritual. Like in, for us, smiling in the Muslim person's face is a form of ibadah. Shaking a person's hand is a ibadah. So ibadah is la shaka, more general, more comprehensive. But because we are limited in the term and the vocabulary that we have in the English language, we sometimes are loose in the translation. Like in Jazakallah Khairan for pointing that out. Barakallah Fee. Should we not use this again? Inshallah, next time we'll avoid it, inshallah. Barakallah Fee. Hey, any other questions? Hey, last question, inshallah. It's, it's صحيح. If you say شهر الله المحرم, you can say المحرم no problem. Al معرف بالألف واللام, you can say it if you want to, or you can make it a نكره indefinite. Some scholars they say that now. No, yeah, some scholars do say that now. جزاكم الله Now, all of those uh, celebrating the New Year's and whatnot, and the first day, do it a specific thing on that particular day. For example, on that day, some people they celebrate it. The first day of Muharram, the families come together and celebration. This is not from our religion. This is not. We only have two Eids. What are the two Eids that we have? Eid al Fitr and Eid al Adha, and Friday, which is Eid of every week. Inshallah, that's more than enough, right? Yeah, Barakallah Fikum.